Uh, thank you very much, Rick, and uh, welcome everyone to this, uh, the second of our joint meetings with, the, with BOPAS. Um, our first speaker um, is Professor William Jeffcott, who I think everyone knows here, but just in case people don't know William, he was an endocrinologist in Nottingham um, but, uh, and started the first diabetic foot clinic there in 1982. He attended the first Malvern Conference in 1986. <laughs> and um, he did retire to go into diabetes research and together with Pan Gain later uh, set up the Specialist Foot Trials Unit in 2002. And he's the clinical lead of the National Diabetes Foot Audit, which you've already heard about. So over to you, William. Thank you very much indeed. It's a privilege to be able to uh, give this short talk uh, at the joint meeting of BOPAS and, um, and the foot meeting. Uh, and um, it also to give an introduction really to the subject of Charcot, which we all think about. Uh, and especially when we've got both orthopedic brains and our own sort of rather uh, miserable little brains to, to share thoughts. Um, I, in talking about Charcot Foot, I should acknowledge that uh, just about all of what I say has been agreed with uh, Fran Game, uh, and if I get anything wrong, then it's my fault and not hers. Uh, and, but it is a privilege, really, uh, to talk about the Charcot Foot because I think I'm the person who's in this room who's been studying it longer than anybody else, indeed, if not in the world, uh, because this was my textbook for learning French just over 60 years ago, and the first chapter was about Charcot. <laughs> and this was not our Charcot, but the son of our Charcot, and I'll come back to him, but first, this is a picture, or a famous picture that many will know, and I hope the pointer works. If I press on the right place, it would help. This is Shaka, of course, with eminent people like Babinski and here and a few others whose names, but that is his son there, Jean-Baptiste, uh, to whom I will return in a short while. But uh, Shaka Père, uh, the father uh, described in 1868, of course, the arthropathy that we know. Interestingly note, to note that the cases, the original case series that he described was in fractures around the knee and in the tibia. And that's something which is now not frequently, uh, no, uh, people don't automatically think of that when they are observed. Uh, and then uh, in 1883, he described uh, disease of the foot. So, Charcot foot, what is it? What's in a name? Well, neuropathic osteoarthropathy, and you can play with these long words, it doesn't matter very much, but when it comes down to the bottom line, it's a condition which we can recognize, uh, but which has no definition, and it has no way of making a diagnosis, which is not a good way to start. And, of course, we can recognize it because of the association uh, of inflammation uh, and of uh, fracture that you can see here uh, and dislocation that goes with it. I wish this thing I didn't have to rotate it around to find the button. Uh, so uh, inflammation, fracture uh, here, dislocation, um, and then secondary uh, deformity and ulceration, obviously. Now, what causes it? Well, if you talk to people, it's all about uh, some sort of injury which you don't perceive because you've got neuropathy and so you walk on it a bit more and then it gets worse and then you get a fracture. And that's, that's, that sort of theory has been going around for over 100 years. Things have got a bit more sophisticated, though, and a bit more complicated. And in the last 15, 20 years, we've been talking about pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so perhaps it's not just the uh, loss of sensation which is critical, uh, causing further damage, but actually release of pro-inflammatory cytokines by whatever pathway uh, that triggers osteoclast maturation and then bone breakdown. So the bones then are progressively weakened, and this again favors fracture dislocation. But that's not the end of the story, uh, because neuropathy also this process, the one I've just been talking about, uh, I wish I could find it, don't, don't do that to me. <laughs> there we go. Uh, this process that we've just been talking about involves the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. 
most of the neurotransmitters which come from the nerve terminals, which are of course lost in people with neuropathy, are actually anti-inflammatory. And so whenever you get pro-inflammatory cytokines, normally, say if you injure, you twist your ankle, or something like that, you will get a release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. But then the process of healing becomes a bit of a sort of a, a balance between pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. But in neuropathy, all these CGRP, substance P, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, all the things that come out of nerve terminals are lost which gives more, uh, ac accentuates the act action of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Diabetes makes it worse, partly because of oxidative stress and advanced glycation end products, as well as changes to the skeleton from glycation. So you can see it's getting uh, a bit complicated, and, but actually the attempts to try and define what's happening with all these cytokines, what are they, there's an awful lot of them, we'll say 20 to, to be thinking about for the moment, um, have not really been tracked or measured systematically or properly, except in a series of three papers uh, published by Agneta Follestad from Sweden, uh, from her PhD, looking at sequential measurement of different cytokines over a period of two years from the presentation of Charcot. I'm not going to give you all those data, but showing a, an amazing variation that some cytokines are going up, some are going down. There's no idea that you put someone in a cast and everything and goes back to normal. It's far more complicated than that, and it reflects this very complicated interrelationships which we don't really yet understand. The last thing about skeletal neuropathy is that you, it's not just triggered by this process that I've been talking about, but because of the loss of anti-inflammatory cytokines, sometimes for many years because of neuropathy, the, you have already pre-existing osteopenia in the bones of the foot and ankle. And so, if you like, the, the, the situation, the stage is set for the onset of the disease. So you then put, add this old concept and this newer concept of a vicious cycle to the effects of neuropathy and osteopenia, uh, pre-existing osteopenia, uh, and you see that this is a sort of complex pathogenic process that we're, we should, I think, be thinking about. But there's one problem. And that is, why is Charcot so uncommon? Because we know neuropathy affects 30% to 50% of people with diabetes. So why, doesn't, why don't 30 to 50% of people get uh, Charcot? And we currently think that is because you need to have something in your peripheral vascular supply which is retained, which can enable the process uh, to uh, initiate and to, to, to d allow the development of the inflammation which we recognize clinically. And people who have had that degree of neuropathy will also have quite major impairments of peripheral limb blood flow. Here are some of the mechanisms. All these slides they, people have access to later, don't they? So isn't that right? So they don't have to write them down. So you can look at all. But just by and, by and large, you've, not, you've got to think of cardiac disease, decreasing blood flow. You've got atherosclerotic disease, decreasing blood flow to your foot. Um, you've got the treatments, beta blockers and what have you. We, you've got medial arterial calcification, uh, which is actually new bone formation in the media of the smaller arterioles. Uh, which limits their capacity for distension. AV shunting of distal vessels, which I can say that Andrew Bolton was actually researching uh, 40 years ago as a trainee in Sheffield, and actually Mike Edmonds at just the same time as a trainee in King's was doing very similar work demonstrating AV shunting. So AV shunting reduced peripheral resistance, the blood flows through to the venous side, so the amount of effective circulation is much reduced. I'm not going to go on about it. It's very complicated, but you can see there are lots of reasons why neuropathy is associated with abnormal blood flow. And then there's some uh, observational evidence to in indicate that this is also um, a factor. And in particular, revascularization has long been known to be a potential trigger for onset of Charcot. 
So the increase in blood flow might in some people be sufficient to start it off. Uh, and then there's experimental data, uh, both from the USA and from Ipswich, uh, from our co-chairman, Jay Raymond's group, uh, looking at the patterns of the capacity of blood vessels to vasodilate and demonstrating that that capacity is better preserved in people with active Charcot than in people who don't have active Charcot. Again, it suggests a mechanism, the way in which they're linked. And I'll draw your attention also to later information, which if you haven't heard, you ought to know, that uh, simultaneous kidney pancreas transplantation is associated with a monstrous in incidence of Charcot disease in the 12 months after the operation undertakes. It's something like 15%. And this is a major cause and all I can suggest is, well, that population will have been screened for cardiac disease, for vascular disease, and they wouldn't have had the operation unless it was thought that they were free from it. So that might be an important factor. So when we're thinking about what causes Charcot, well, I've talked about inflammation, of course, fracture dislocation, which we all know about. It can be in the foot, but it, don't forget the knee. Uh, and then... It occurs in people with neuropathy, but people with neuropathy who've got some preservation of whatever aspects of vascular blood flow is, is important. And so this question about the Charcot foot, is it a perfect storm? It's rare because it only occurs in people who've got a certain number of things. Uh, is true, except I hate the, tra the phrase a perfect storm. No storm is perfect. Uh, it's imperfect, if anything. Um, and in this particular case, I'll take you back as I finish to the son, uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Jean Charcot, who when his father died in 1896 or whenever it was, uh, inherited an awful lot of money. And so he then did, in my little bit of French lecture, he says the boy then, as a child, was saying, Dad, I don't want to be a doctor, I don't want to be a doctor, I want to be a sailor. Uh, and then as soon as his father died, he became a sailor. Uh, and he... Then if you go down there, he was qualified as a doctor. He then was an Olympic silver medalist in sailing in 1900. He then became a famous Arctic, Antarctic and Arctic explorer. In the Antarctic, he named Charcot Island after his father and one particular person in the room, uh, Alison Musgrove, who gave a talk just a short while ago, has actually been to Charcot Island because I know I've seen a photo of it. Uh, and, but Jean-Baptiste died when his ship, the Poor Coapa, here uh, was lost off Iceland in 1936. Uh, and that's why I don't like talking about a, 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 a whatever the phrase, uh, I've got the phrase of, uh, I've forgotten what it is now, the perfect storm, uh, because it's a, really a tragic uh, consequence of an imperfect storm. That's all I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you.